Dear Father, we do thank you so much uh, for this faithful servant who served your servant, Abraham, who went into a land that was not his own, and he found for Isaac, the next matriarch of the bloodline. We thank you for uh, his faithfulness to follow where you led, but we recognize that overall it was your faithfulness in providing, your faithfulness in showing, and your faithfulness in convincing. And so we do recognize that you are the hero of this story and that you are the provider and that it is your truth and your faithfulness that stands supreme. And so we do uh, pray that as we go through the passage this morning, that we would have our eyes trained firmly on you. We do praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. You may all be seated. That's a long passage. You guys are probably all thinking, when are we going to get to the potluck? Now, my first lesson from this is the servant also waited to eat until he had gone through this message, so we can too. Just a reminder of where we're at. We are almost finished with our uh, travels through the life of Abraham. We're coming right near the end, and he actually doesn't appear much in the rest of these uh, verses that we're going to study. We're going to go through about halfway through Genesis 25. So we get to meet him once more to hear that he married again and died. Uh, that's the end of the life of Abraham. And so these chapters are occupied with finding the next line or the next generation with Isaac and his wife to be Rebecca. In chapter 24, which you'll remember is Moses's climax here in this story of the life of Isaac. We've divided it into four sections from four different, uh, four different interactions that occur between four different sets of people. We had Abraham and his servant in Canaan. Then we had Ab or the servant and Rebekah in Aram Naharaim or Mesopotamia. And then Today, we get to look at the servant and his discussion with Laban, the brother of Rebekah. This servant has traveled about 450 miles. Uh, it would have taken him over a month to get there by the means that he traveled, camel with a few uh, other servants. And he's probably in this city just south of where Abraham had left from. Abraham left from the city of Haran, and his brother Nahor settled south of that and what became the city of Nahor. Well, now, as we go through this very, very repetitious uh, section, we want to keep these at the forefront of our mind because this servant is using this for a very specific purpose, and he's very tactful in the events he chooses to present to Laban and the events he chooses to ignore. The servant demonstrates what it means to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove in the company of worldly-minded people. He reframes the situation from God's perspective for Rebecca's family. The servant does not coerce or force the situation, but relies on the continuing faithfulness of God to fulfill his promises. And the servant puts his mission and God's will first before his own personal comfort. So we break this into three sections here for ease of consumption. First, we see that Laban is going for reward. He has a different motivation than uh, Rebecca had, and the servant is going to set him straight by reporting to him all that has happened and demonstrating to him that it is truly God's will and not a standard marriage negotiation. And then Laban recognizes this and gives up Rebecca. We'll start by introducing this character because this is actually the first time that we see him. Now Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. Now you'll remember in the last eight or so verses, we saw Rebecca continuing to run, to move quickly, to go up and down from the spring, and she was doing this with a servant's heart and a servant's attitude. We see Laban running as well, but we'll see pretty soon that he had his own 
personal interests at heart rather than service. Laban is not Rebekah's father. He's Rebekah's brother. He and Rebekah are both children of Bethuel. Bethuel was a child of Nahor and Milcah. Remember, Nahor was the brother of Abraham, both children of Terah. And Milcah was actually his niece. Milcah was the niece of Nahor, the daughter of Haran, one of Abraham and Nahor's brothers. So this is a very internalized family. And now this servant has been sent back to the same bloodline to gather someone from the same bloodline. There are a lot of different theories as to why this is. Some say because these were worshipers of the one true God and therefore it had to stay in the line of the one true God worshipers. But we also got evidence that the people in Gaza at this time also knew the one true God. We also saw that in Jabus, later Jerusalem, there were people who knew God. There were God-fearers in the land. They didn't have to go all the way back to Haran to get that. In fact, in Haran, we, give, we have very strong evidence that these were polygamists and, nope, that's the wrong word, not polygamists, though they were that too. They worshipped multiple gods, mainly the moon god. Laban was probably not a God-fearer, probably not a worshiper of the one true God. This was the family that Abraham had been pulled out of because it was not uh, following God. They were pagans. There's also a theory that it was pulled out in order to keep the bloodline pure. This is a better idea, but really the purity of the bloodline is not the issue. The issue is that God is pulling out a nation from among the nations. He is not gathering the nations together into a conglomerate uh, bloodline. I'm going to sound super nerdy here, but that's kind of the theme of the book and movie series Dune. They want to gather from the bloodlines of every nation, every race, every planet to make the one Kwisatz Haderach, their Messiah. This is entirely opposite of what God is doing here. He is not gathering from every nation. He's not sampling every bloodline. He is gathering from one. And he gathers from two generations of barren women. All of this has the same purpose, to show that it is God and God alone, and not the world and the world's nations that produces the Messiah. God is going back to this one bloodline so that no nation will be able to say, we did that. We brought this about. The world will not be able to look at the Messiah and say that was our work, but that it was always God's work. And so that is why the servant is sent back to Terah's family, because this is the family that God has chosen to work through. This is the royal seed line that God has promised since Adam and Eve, since Noah and his sons, through Shem, now through Terah, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, down to Judah, to David, to Mary and Joseph, to Jesus. God has planned this ahead of time. Laban is the brother of Rebekah, and so we might wonder why when the servant comes, he does all of his negotiations or convincing with Laban. Laban's a character we're going to get to know a lot better later in the text. And I promise you, if you don't already dislike him, you will dislike him a lot by the time we're done with him. In Genesis 29, we see that Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. A lot of repetition here that this is family, this is his mother's brother, and pointing back constantly to this chapter, chapter 24, because as we'll see in a few verses, what happened? In this situation, Laban went out to water the servants' camels to serve them. Here we have Jacob serving Laban. Jacob is going to continue to serve Laban for years and years and years. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field and said to them, 
I see your father's attitude that it is not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. God is going to use Laban later in Jacob's life as well to teach Jacob about essentially the usury of the world and God's faithfulness. God continues to remain faithful while this man, Laban, just uses and uses and uses him. This is just a a closer look at Laban than we get in Genesis 24, but we see the same man with the same personality and the same attitude in chapter 24, just a few years younger and perhaps not as drastic or dramatic. And we get this from Genesis 24.30 because Laban's response is based on something he saw when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. Moses is very careful and very tactful about this one specific phrase that he uses over and over and over and over again in Genesis. And the first time we see it is when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband and with her, and he ate. Laban is concerned with what he sees and what he values to be good, what he desires and what he wants. He is assessing the situation, assessing that it's good for him. Because Rebecca went and served this man. She went over and above serving him, and he blessed her with gifts. And remember last time we made note that these are not dowry gifts. These were gifts for the service that she had provided. This was a thanks. And now we see Laban rushing to receive some thanks for himself as well. Notice, especially considering back in Genesis 3.6, the issue was that Rebecca or that uh, Eve abandoned God's interpretation of the situation and adopted her own assessment of the situation. Right now, Laban has a worldly assessment of the situation. The need of the servant is to reframe so that Laban can see the situation through God's perspective, so that he can see the divine interpretation of what is going on here. And it is going to change this man's mind. Unfortunately, it doesn't do much to change the man himself, as we see in Genesis 29 through 31. But he will recognize that this is not his decision. This is God's decision. But he says, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? Now, this is actually more coercive. Actually, this is coercive, whereas Rebecca was not coercive at all. She went and just did the things, and she did them quickly, almost before he had the opportunity to make a decision. Here we see Laban not actually taking any time to prepare, seeing the riches that Rebecca has come with, and rushing out to meet this servant and telling him, what are you doing? Get in my house. I've already prepared everything for you. Now, have you ever had this situation where somebody offers to do something for you and you say, oh, no, I, I, I'm okay. I'd really rather not. Oh, no, it's already done. It, it'd go to waste if you don't. This is kind of the coercion that Laban is doing here to the servant. He's already made the preparations. He's already done all the work to prepare it, which we see no evidence of in the text. And he's saying, essentially, don't spurn my good grace. Don't say no to my hospitality. I've already prepared it, and this word prepared has the meaning of cleaning. He's already cleaned or decluttered his house and the place where the camels will stay. He's cleared the space for him. All things are prepared. What Laban is doing is ingratiating himself to this servant. 
He wants to get in his good graces. He wants to cozy up alongside this guy who just showed up in this little town of Nahor with 10 camels filled with riches and servants following behind him. So the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels. Remember what the camels were loaded with. He gave straw and feed to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Now, some people do point out that here Laban is going above and beyond what he promised. And so some will point out and say that he's actually has no bad intentions here. He's not acting greedily, but he's acting just like Rebecca in doing over and above what he promised to do. However, when we look at the customs of the day, back in Genesis 8, 3 through 5, and we remember what Abraham had promised to do as customary, and then he went over and above what was customary. When the three angels appeared to him he said, uh, and said, he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree and I will bring a piece of bread. This was Abraham being humble, not over and above braggadocious about the things that he is going to do to serve. These were customary, these were expected. It's everything that he actually does without saying he's going to do it that is over and above the custom. He quickly prepared three measures of fine flour, kneaded it, and made bread cakes, Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and a calf, which he had prepared, and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. This was above and beyond service. Washing your feet was something that would be rude not to offer. In other words, Laban would be acting completely against the customs of the day had he not done that as well. Well, at this point, it seems or it appears that the servant is getting a little uncomfortable with the situation. And the discomfort seems to go back to one phrase. When Laban invited him into the house, he says, come in, blessed of the Lord. Literally, come in, one whom Yahweh has blessed. He uses this covenant name for God in speaking in relationship to this servant as the direct recipient of blessing from Yahweh. When the food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. And Laban says, speak on. And here, before he does anything else, he corrects Laban's thinking. He says, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master. The servant isn't the one who owns these possessions. The servant isn't the one to whom they belong. The servant isn't the direct recipient of God's blessing Abraham is. And the servant serves Abraham and receives blessing through Abraham. And so Abraham is the one who should be exalted here because God has exalted him. And now the servant recognizes Laban's focus on the riches. He recognizes that this servant sees how wealthy, or this Laban sees how wealthy the servant is and identifies that as blessing from the Lord. And so he says, the Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich. This is true. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. But this is the blessing of God that far surpassed all others. This is the one that Laban should be focused on, and this is the reason the servant is here. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. The servant has reframed the situation. Away from the riches, away from the wealth, away from the opulence that he arrived with, and he gets down to the heart of the issue. God has blessed Abraham in a way no other man has been blessed. He has given him a son in his old age. Three times Sarah passed a different point in her life in which she would not be able to have children. 
She was barren, unable to conceive. Then she went through menopause. Then she became 90 years old, way past the years of menopause. There is simply no way that Sarah could have had a child apart from the direct intervention of God, apart from God bringing life back to her womb. This was the promise. This is the promise that continues. And remember, when Abraham in chapter 15 is promised reward, what's his response? Essentially, what good is reward without a descendant? This is the mindset of the servant as well. The riches are one thing. The descendant is totally another. And now he goes to retelling about the oath that he has made with his master, Abraham. He is committed to do it, and this is why he's here. He said, My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. You shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. Now this actually adds a bit of information that we didn't see back in the beginning of the chapter where he just says that he will go to his country and to his relatives. So we did know that we're looking for a descendant or a uh, relative, but we didn't realize just how direct that relative is supposed to be until this servant tells Nahor, or uh, rather uh, Laban, that this is supposed to be a direct descendant from Terah's own, from Abraham's own father, Terah. And so he says, I said to my master, suppose the woman does not follow me. Now, there will be a few things that are said that the servant does not choose to include. This one he chooses to include for a very specific reason. I think that reason is to show that he has no personal stake in this matter. To show Laban that he's not serving his master out of selfish or personal gain or need. It's not that Abraham has made him promise this and he's going to kill him if he doesn't do it. Or he's going to disinherit him if he doesn't do it. Essentially, he's saying, I am under no obligation except the obligation I have of faithfulness to my master. Suppose the woman does not follow me. Abraham's response, the Lord, before whom I have walked, will send his angel with you to make your journey successful. And you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Now, Abraham has framed this in the sense of the Abrahamic covenant, specifically in the clause which amplifies this seed promise. It was Genesis 17, 1 through 2, where it says, Now, when Abraham was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham has received this multiplication. He has uh, received a descendant son. He has gotten past Genesis 22 where he retained that son. And now he recognizes that it's time for the next generation. And he sees that God has been faithful to his promise, that this covenant would be given to the next generation. And so he's, he is the one who has walked before the Lord, and now this next generation will walk before the Lord, but it has to be along the lines of the Lord's will. The conclusion is that he will be free from this oath when he comes to his relatives. Notice he's not free from his oath when he comes back. Abraham told him, go to them, deliver this message essentially, and then you're free from this oath. The word used for oath here also is different. It's actually a bit of an amplification of what we saw before. The servant seems to be forcing the seriousness of this issue. Here, the oath literally means a curse. He will be free from this curse. When we saw it the first time, it was simply in a self-imprecatory promise, a sebua. 
Now, this is essentially the same thing, but the idea in the sebua is more focused on the promise. The idea in the curse is more focused on the consequence. And so he is essentially saying he will be free from this promise with consequence so long as he brings this message to his relatives. That's as far as his promise extends. And then he clarifies even further. If they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. There is not going to be any consequence on this servant if the family refuses to give up Rebecca or if Rebecca refuses to come. The servant has no need and no reason to use any untoward tactics to try to convince them to come. Now notice in this retelling of his conversation with Abraham, what he skipped. Back in Genesis 24, 6 through 8, he had this conversation with Abraham. And everything in yellow is what he tells to, uh, to Laban, and everything in pink is what he skipped. Beware that you do not take my son back there. The God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying, to your descendants I will give this land, only do not take my son back there. He skips everything about Abraham abandoning the family line, abandoning the place where he has now gone back to get Rebekah from. He skips all promises of inheritance of the land. He's focused on the seed and the seed promise and God's guidance. He is not spurning his, his uh, host by saying that God has made it so that the descendant will not go back there. Isaac never goes there. Isaac never goes to Nahor or to Haran. Jacob will. And when he goes, he'll be used and abused. Well, now the servant comes to the climax of his story, where he actually meets Rebecca. He says, so I came today to the spring, the very same day that he is retelling this to Laban. And he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful. Now notice this time he says successful. Last time he said, if you will bring me good fortune. He is drawing a contrast between Laban's desire for fortune and his desire for success in God's will. Oops. If you will bring me, if you will make my journey on which I go successful, behold, I am standing by the spring, and may it be that the maiden who comes out to draw, and to, to whom I say, please let me drink a little water from your jar. Now he uses a different word for maiden here, but it really just brings the two ideas that he used before together. Last time he said a marriable woman uh, who had no relations with a husband. Here he simply says a virgin youth. This is a summary term that he uses to speak of Rebecca. And in his prayer to the Lord, he says, she will say to me, she will say to me, you drink and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. His focus here is to find the woman that God has chosen, that God has selected, that God will bring to Isaac. And before I had finished speaking in my heart, he adds this information to us as well. Last time he didn't tell us that this was a silent prayer. Now when he is retelling this to Laban, he adds this information that this was a silent prayer, perhaps to avoid any uh, statement that Laban might think or make that Rebecca had simply heard him say this. The servant is going to extreme detail to make sure that Laban sees God's hand in this and not mankind's hand. Behold, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew, and I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. Now in this repetition of the dialogue with 
Rebecca, he is far more detailed than in his recollection of his conversation with Abraham. He doesn't skip over anything. He shows exactly the fulfillment of God's promise. He says, Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. Now here there's a reversal. Before, when we saw this happen, we saw him put the ring and the bracelets on her before he asks whose daughter she is. Some will say that this is to say that they happened at the same time, and so it doesn't matter which order they go in, that he was putting the ring and the bracelets on her while having this conversation with her. This may be, but I think literarily the reason for reversing these two is to frame the entire conversation around the issue that Laban has. He saw this ring and he saw these bracelets, and that is what set him off. The servant then recounts having bowed low and worshipped the Lord. This is the only uh, speech act that occurred in this episode that is not reported directly. He doesn't say what words that he said. This is probably for decorum. He's not going to announce what his prayer was. But he simply summarizes that he blessed the Lord. He says that Lord was the God of my master, Abraham, who had guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Well, at this point, it has become quite clear, hopefully, and it appears it will be, to Laban, that this entire situation is not an accident. That this entire situation is not conceived of or derived by man. But that God, the one true God, the one who has blessed Abraham with all these riches that so attract Laban, he's the one who directed the servant to Laban's household to bring Rebekah back for Isaac. And so there's a recognition here of the fact of God's sovereignty over the issue. The servant then proposes, so now if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, Tell me, and if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or the left. Now notice, the servant does not ask Laban for Rebekah. He does not ask permission to take her. He does not say, so there's the deal. Can I have the girl or what? No, he says, are you going to deal kindly and truly with my master? This was the content of the prayer that he skipped. This was the content, the words that he did not repeat or report to Laban. The man bowed low and worshipped the Lord, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness, his hesed, and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. He saw that God had guided him this far and that that God was motivated by his covenant faithfulness and by the truth of his words. And he's asking Laban here, is he also going to deal in covenant faithfulness with Abraham? Remember, when he greeted this servant, he says, blessed of Yahweh, the covenant name for God. He's essentially saying, are you going to honor this covenant that God has with Abraham? Are you going to deal in truth with my master, Abraham? Then Laban and Bethuel replied. Now notice this is also the first time we see Bethuel coming into the dialogue. Laban has been doing all of the talking. This is probably a fratriarchal household, meaning that it is the brother's responsibility to make the marriage covenant. This was one reason why Abraham would say that he was Sarah's brother when they went down to, uh, down to Egypt because it would be the brother's responsibility to, to uh, receive the dowry. And he receives a dowry from the king of Egypt. Laban here is seeking a dowry for Rebekah. But Laban and Bethuel, the father of Rebekah and Laban, 
They both replied, the matter comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Notice, just as the servant does not ask for their permission, neither do they give it. Why? Because that's not the issue. They recognize here that what would normally be their choice, what would normally now result in a conversation over how much is Rebecca worth, how much will we get for her, will it recompense what we are losing in her value to our household? None of that is discussed because Laban and Bethuel, from this simple reframing of their worldly view to God's sovereign faithfulness, recognize they're not part of this decision. And so they say, here is Rebecca before you, take her and go. And let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. No request for payment, no request for dowry. Perhaps they knew of God's words to Abraham before he left Haran. Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. Remember, Laban reminded them of this word. He switched from the word that Abraham had used with him and he recalls this word for curse. And then he reminds Laban of the covenant faithfulness of God. This has said, I would almost wonder if this event humbled Laban. So he recognized which God exactly he's dealing with. Seeing the miraculous power of this God in bringing Sarah, a child. Not only Sarah, but Sarah in her old age a child. Remember in Genesis 11.30, before she left the household of, of Terah, and she was Nahor's sister, they already knew she was barren. This is a pretty powerful God that Laban is dealing with. This is a God who has never failed in one of his promises. This is a God who will not fail in his promise to curse anyone who treats Abraham lightly. But this is also a God who is faithful to the promise that he will bless those who bless Abraham. And so the ser servant lets Rebekah go. And the servants, Laban lets, lets Rebekah go and the servant bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. We've seen this before in the text as well, where he fully prostrates himself on the ground. This isn't a Japanese bow where you just bow deep. This is laying yourself fully on the floor in awe of what God has just done. This is ultimately the climax. This was the last hill or hurdle to get over. The family could have put up a fight. They could have said, no way, Jose, pay us first. Or no way, she's not leaving, bring Isaac here. Both things that... God had said could not happen. God is faithful, though, to his covenant. God is faithful to his promise to bless those who bless Abraham. And in relinquishing Rebekah, the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah, and also gave precious things to her brother, Laban, and to her mother, Milcah. They did receive riches. They did receive reward and wealth. But they didn't do it by their work. They didn't do it by the way that mankind has devised of getting rich. They did it by trusting in God and not seeking that reward. But instead, recognizing God's sovereignty, recognizing who he is, and deferring to him in the decision, in the situation, it's not until that point that they finally eat. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. At this point, Laban receives the hospitality. After he has already given these riches to Rebekah and to this family, 
Now, come back next week to see how Laban tries to trick him next time. Um, Laban's not a cured man. We never get any evidence that Laban is a saved man. Laban is a pagan, a moon worshiper in the family line of Abraham. But he was the family out of which God called Abraham and God called Isaac and God called Jacob to make a nation of his own creation, not having ties to this world, but having ties to the world to come. And so in conclusion, the servant demonstrates what it means to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. He does not use any worldly tactics, any vain devices to try to coerce the situation. He does this in the company of worldly-minded people, and in so doing, he restructures their frame of mind from this worldly desire for riches to recognition of the sovereign God of Israel. He reframes this situation from God's perspective for Rebekah's family. The servant does not coerce or force the situation, but relies on the continuing faithfulness that has said of God to fulfill his promises, the truth of his promises. The servant puts his mission and God's will first before his own personal comfort. Let's pray. Dear Father, we do thank you for your truth and for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are the one who fights the battles before us and that we just simply stand in the finished work of Christ. We know that we will have the promises that you have given to us and that nothing can take them from us because they are placed on your uh, word and not on ours. They are placed in your action and not in ours. So we do thank you that you have dealt so kindly with us to make it a guarantee that we will spend our eternity with you when we are called out of this world. We do praise you and thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.